I'm Jack Wells from Crazy National Lab. Um, I'm going to give a, a talk here, um, learning through uh, leadership scale computing. Um, uh, my collaborators in putting this together are Fernanda Forder, who, when we wrote the abstract, was with us, but she now works for NVIDIA. It's a bad trend. Um, and Arjun Shankar and uh, Jack Wells from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. It's not sustainable. Um, so um, what is machine learning? Um, machine learning is a type of uh, artificial intelligence that provides computers with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Um, and machine learning focuses on the development of computer programs that can change when exposed to new data. The process of machine learning is similar to that of data mining. Both systems look through data for patterns, but instead of extracting the data for human comprehension, it is the case of data mining, as in data mining, machine learning uses data that detects patterns in data and just programs actions accordingly. Machine learning algorithms are often categorized as being supervised or unsupervised. Um, supervised algorithms can apply what has been learned from the past to new data. Unsupervised can draw uh, inferences from data sets. So what is leadership computing? Um, I defined this this morning if you were in the keynote, but basically it means um, computing that is capability limited, that you need some capability um, uh, architectural feature of our supercomputing center that you don't have enough of at your, um, your center. And so you, in order to do something unique, you need more of it, be it processing power or memory or bandwidth, et cetera. And it goes along with the, what we call leadership scale computing, where we basically mean we want to provide the largest um, compute and data infrastructure for solving um, the most challenging problems. Um, and so um, what I'm going to present here in the talk concerns uh, the following uh, three points. Um, I'm going to discuss uh, science requirements gathering that we've done over the last couple of years where we've seen a strong growth in um, data analytics and uh, artificial intelligence uh, type applications within our uh, stakeholder base and how that's been documented and how we're trying to respond to that. Um, I'll give a, a brief introduction to Summit. It's already been introduced. And then I'll go deeper on uh, four case studies, um, actually the same four case studies I outlined this morning. So um, experimental and observational data science is exploding within DOE Office of Science. There's a vast array of experimental and observational user facilities, um, and they are producing uh, more uh, higher rate and multi-dimensional data sets um, that are pushing um, experimental computing off of the desktop and into the data center. Um, this is a workshop that was uh, organized in uh, 2015 by Lucy Knoll, who's a program manager in DOE Office of Science. And to me, it was um, one of the first um, DOE-wide efforts to document these requirements from uh, com computing requirements and experimental and observational uh, science in the context of our scientific computing enterprise. Um, this is a slide that was contributed to that workshop from one of my collaborators at Oak Ridge, Sergei Kalinin. Um, he is the director of the Institute for Functional Imaging of Materials at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences. And it's a summary chart from one of his publications that documents a variety of techniques that have been developed in his laboratory for scanning probe microscopy. And um, the details of this chart are not what, so, um, uh, what I want to communicate. Um, but it's rather that um, over about a 10-year period, because of the um, innovations within his laboratory in putting multiple sensors to, to um, extract new channels of information um, from the experimental process, um, his data requirements went from tens of uh, megabytes to uh, hundreds of gigabytes. Right? And this is in a one room in um, one nanoscience center at uh, one national laboratory. So um, the dimensionality increase here just drives the data requirements very uh, strongly. Um, of course, um, there's a lot of new here for experimental and observational um, scientists who in the past have used homegrown techniques for data management, home, homegrown techniques for data analysis. 
they uh, quickly were swimming over their head, even some of the best groups. Um, and so they were trying to understand how to respond to this, and this was sort of his contribution to this workshop I referenced about we, we need help, we need um, more um, hardened, more systematic, um, better founded techniques for dealing with this data. Um, following up with that, um, our sponsor asked the uh, DOE Supercomputing Centers um, in the Office of Science, being a Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Argonne National Laboratory, and Oak Ridge, to develop um, a series of exascale requirements uh, workshops. And over a two-year period, we did um, six um, workshops, each with one of the six program offices within DOE, and then we summarized that with a cross-cutting workshop. The goals were to identify the mission science objectives that require advanced scientific computing storage networking at the exascale time frame and determine future requirements for a computing ecosystem that included data, software, tools, and libraries. And one of the themes, a theme relevant to this talk, is um, large-scale data storage and analysis. So um, high-level summaries were that experimental and simulated data set volumes were growing exponentially in, in the scientific domains. Examples were the the high luminosity runs expected at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, light sources like those that are uh, built and being extended at the uh, Stanford National Accelerator Facility, climate science, which is multimodal, cosmology data, all these data sets are or will soon be at hundreds of petabytes, and we don't have the capability to process all these today. And that, um, likewise, methods and workflows for data analytics are, are much different from those in traditional HPC that are built on um, the foundation of, of continuum-based analytics and you know, partial differential equations, um, et cetera. And that the machine learning is uh, revolutionizing our, uh, our field, um, uh, established analysis data. Still hanging in there. So um, from our cross-cut report, there are these uh, couple of summary uh, statements. Uh, performing analysis of big data sets and drawing inferences based on these data are revolutionizing many fields, and new approaches are needed for analyzing large data sets, including advanced statistics and machine learning. And on the software and application development side, scalable data analysis, data processing, data analysis, machine learning, discrete analysis, and understanding these large data, uh, large-scale data that will be produced by exascale systems is a new driver for our, um, uh, our infrastructure, the one that we, we need to build out. And um, this is new. This wasn't a requirement um, really, for example, when we um, wrote the procurement for Jaguar, when we wrote the procurement for, for Titan, or even really when we wrote the procurement for Summit. Um, this is relatively new, I would say, in, 2014, when we signed the contract with our vendor partners um, for Summit, we didn't have a lot of users in this space, but I just made a list of the number of user projects with PIs um, that um, have uh, been awarded uh, projects at our center over the last couple of years, um, and, it, and it, it, um, it's been a, a rapidly growing activity. Uh, scientists are coming to us um, because we have a large GPU accelerated cluster now, because they know that um, Summit's coming with even more uh, data analysis capabilities, that um, uh, this is a place where um, uh, this kind of analysis uh, will need to happen. So Summit's coming. Um, it's slated to be the most powerful and smartest supercomputer um, at, uh, for open science. Um, as I said this morning, um, it's it's smart, the architecture is expected to be smart in the sense that it has the, the graphics processing brawn, high-speed data movement, and has a memory where it matters. Here's a note overview. And just from our um, um, advanced data and workflow group, our early preliminary observations on running these workflows, attempting to run these workflows on, on the summit architecture um, that the deep learning codes uh, like convolutional neural networks, ResNet uh, 50, excel on the GPUs and, and um, with the non-volatile memory um, are enabling uh, the tensor operations uh, very efficiently. And um, preloading the data on the non-volatile memory shows near perfect scaling for uh, preliminary data sets on ResNet through about 64 nodes. It's early days, but these are some of our early experiences. 
And then likewise, um, on um, sort of the middle part of that diagram, traditional principal component analysis, k-means, et cetera, are excelling uh, due to the node's memory, uh, the, the um, very strong CPU, and the on-chip um, bandwidth. So um, things are looking very good in the early days, and most of the energy is going into scaling up the frameworks to uh, uh, or scale out the frameworks to use more and more of the infrastructure we have on individual applications. So um, in the remainder of this talk, I want to just uh, do a little bit of a dive on each of these um, uh, applications um, that are challenges for a smart supercomputer. Um, in materials, um, the example I, I've already started is a multimodal characterization of materials. Um, novel microscopic and spectroscopic techniques allow the characterization of different aspects of the materials at the nanoscale. And the associated data analysis is very difficult, and outcomes um, uh, are big data up to terabytes, and it's multidimensional. And the combination of the microscopic and the spectroscopic techniques is what is really meant by multimodal, is required for the comprehension and characterization of materials. If we had been thoughtful enough about this, it was inevitable that this problem would have presented itself because um, the experimenters have always said that we need to understand the structure of materials to, to then move on to the, to the function of materials and the performance of materials and then beyond the performance to be able to design materials. So in the kinds of information you need from structure to function to overall and then on to design, observation, data analytics, integrated. So for example, a secondary ion mass spectroscopy can be combined with atomic force microscopy, enabling a correlated uh, characterization of the functional response at the nanoscale. And that can be composition information. Optical spectroscopy can be added um, for the characterization of the optical properties and studied at the same time by ensemble crystal, uh, crystallographs, increasing the dimensionality. So analysis of multimodal data is even more complicated because of this dimensionality, and it requires new infrastructure. It also requires new mathematical methods. So here's just a chart that tries to show how on the individual um, material, these kinds of um, uh, uh, sensors can be integrated to produce uh, in-dimensional uh, data sets. OK, moving on to the fusion application. Um, so uh, deep learning can be used to predict plasma disruptions in a tokamak reactor. The most critical problem for fusion energy, you can say, is how to avoid or mitigate large-scale major disruptions. That is, that your, the energy of your, um, of your tokamak could be dissipated in a way that could um, disrupt or harm the, the, um, the reactor itself. So the, the approach being tried at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory on a team led by uh, Bill Tang is to use um, a big data-driven statistical machine learning predictions for the occurrence of disruption in the joint European Taurus jet, which is the largest uh, tokamak um, on our planet right now and has a lot of data on this from um, experimental studies of disruptions over about a decade-long period. Um, after getting access to this data, the Princeton team's goals include improving the physics fidelity of, of the development of their multidimensional uh, time-dependent software um, to include better classifiers, to develop, um, well, and the, the, the challenge is, is pretty stiff because in order to um, um, ameliorate the disruption, they need to be able to respond within about 50 uh, microseconds. And to develop a, a, a portable cross-machine prediction software uh, beyond JET to other devices and eventually ITER. What that means is they need to be able to train the classifiers on one tokamak and then apply them to uh, a yet constructed tokamak because that's going to be the challenge at ITER, say train on JET or other uh, tokamaks and then apply the, um, uh, the, the classifiers on ITER because it, it may be um, too dangerous at ITER to um, expose the machine to development of this large data set without the ability to mitigate disruptions. Okay, so um, 
And then there's the uh, computational science and engineering task of developing and deploying these uh, machine learning software uh, via a deep learning recurrent neural networks. And, and they uh, have been active in this field over the last two years. Um, they've um, been scaling on many of the large GPU accelerated supercomputers around the world, in the US, in Switzerland, and in Japan. And um, they are uh, getting going on Summit um, these days. This are some scaling data for TensorFlow plus MPI um, using singularity, singularity containers on, on Titan, scaling up to about 6,000 GPUs. OK. Um, another uh, case study comes from the Fermilab, uh, Fermi uh, National Accelerator Facility, and a particular neutrino experiment there called Minerva. Um, uh, collaborators from Fermi and Oak Ridge uh, um, improved Fermilab's machine learning networks uh, for vertex reconstruction. This is where, um, as shown in uh, the data in the blue charts, uh, the tracks that uh, indicate um, the path of particles inside the detectors and are really the, the subjects of the study need to be classified. And this is a, um, an image classification problem in three dimensions, um, but one that needs to be done uh, very rapidly and at scale. Um, so um, the tool that was applied here was one developed at Oak Ridge called Mendel. Um, the, the premise of Mendel is that for every uh, data set, there exists a corresponding neural network that performs optimally with that data. You may not know what that architecture of the network is, but, but it exists. So um, um, this group said, let's search for it with the genetic algorithm. Um, so they uh, developed these evolutionary algorithms to search the optimal hyperparameters and topologies of the machine learning networks. And they, they demonstrated on, on Titan using all of the resource that um, the high energy physics data um, uh, could, uh, the classification of the high energy physics data on, uh, uh, from the Minerva experiment could be improved. And this was exact, this has been, uh, this same technique has been uh, evaluated on multiple diverse data sets like standard computer vision data sets and um, uh, data from the spallation neutron source, small angle scattering um, from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So um, this is now being ported uh, to, uh, to Summit um, in order to do even bigger problems. And th the last uh, example comes from uh, healthcare. Uh, so there is a big data revolution in healthcare. Uh, it's well underway, and advances in machine learning um, uh, coupled with the explosion of healthcare data is showing promise for accelerated biomedical research and discovery, clinical decision support, um, guiding uh, the vision of personalized health treatments, helping uncover better preventive practices and improving workflow and streaming communications and coordinating. So, and also um, offering new ways to handle waste, fraud, and abuse, which is actually the initial driver at Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, for getting involved in the health data sciences. Um, um, one particular use case comes from um, um, can cancer pathology reports and uh, registries um, of cancer pathology reports in different states. Each state manages these cancer pathology reports in different ways and different data sets. They are uh, text-based documents that are full of errors and are so voluminous that probably no one single person can read them. So um, natural language um, uh, processing analysis is being applied to these uh, data sets in order to uh, scale up their analysis and extract more information that would have uh, laid dormant inside the registries um, without um, machine learning techniques. This is, uh, uh, this is being ported to Summit uh, right now. So with that, I'll conclude the talk. Uh, Summit is still under construction, and we expect um, uh, to accept the machine this summer, and we're getting users on, um, and we'll start our user programs uh, next year. So um, with that, are there any questions? Are we close? So ITER is a, um, is a science experiment. The goals of ITER are not to produce electricity, but it's to sustain a a burning plasma, a, a, a reaction that produces more um, energy than is, um, um, th than is required to generate the plasma. Um, so it won't produce any electricity. So for example, 
part of the experiment is to actually cool the walls um, so that the issues with the plasma material interface can be uh, more effectively managed, right? Um, in order to produce electricity, you would want the walls to get hot, to have a big delta T so you can boil water and make steam and turn a turbine, right? Um, the, the community experiment that comes after ITER will be the one that takes on those engineering challenges of actually producing electricity. Its name is DEMO. So if you hear about DEMO being constructed, um, then you'll know we're getting closer to engineering scale application of fusion energy. Right, right now, it's a, a very large, very challenging science experiment. Is that a good answer? 